more evidence for the game plan here as we've been discussing for over a year. This idea that China and Russia, and perhaps even the global south in some respects, I mean, we've been seeing it across the board, have been looking to reduce the exports of raw commodities to the West. And this is the Achilles heel of the West, and it's known, and we see it with the reduction in oil. We see it with germanium and gallium, and now we're seeing it with graphite, and there's even hints about cobalt as China starts to up its reserves. So it continues here. Now, graphite, of course, I've heard different numbers on the amount, and we'll look closer in our news stories today, but I've seen different numbers on how much graphite is refined by China, and it is significant. Like, I've seen as high as, like, 98%. If memory serves, I've seen, as we'll see in this article, maybe as low as 60%. It depends on the kind of graphite. But all to say, graphite is required for this whole energy transition as it's currently framed. Now, I'm very pleased to announce that we have Robert Friedland from the Canadian Mining Symposium on this week's episode. And this is, I was going to say, this is awesome. And it kind of is, as bleak as this talk is, It is a very interesting discussion. And basically, you know, again, as currently framed for the green strategy, these electric vehicle batteries are not going to happen, according to Robert Friedland. There is simply not enough nickel available. There is not enough nickel that can be mined. It is not going to happen. So as Friedland says, you know, what's the plan here? We've been discussing this for, you know, longtime listeners to the program. I've been showing skepticism towards this, you know, green strategy for probably two years, maybe longer. It is possible it's longer. And as Friedland says, there is zero chance, and that is a quote, there's enough nickel for electric car batteries as they are currently thought out. Now, you know, part of the many quotable aspects of this talk that Friedland gave is he is basically saying that one of these companies he has invested in with MIT professors and a Nobel Prize winner will turn the battery market upside down, replacing lithium ion with lithium metal. And I think for a lot of people, that's kind of a distinction without a difference, but I think it is quite important. That was news to me. And what I think we have to appreciate, what I appreciate from Robert Friedland's talk, is the extensive use of science in the talk. And it really does give credibility. because. As he says, you know, it's like a lot of us out here are simply reading news articles and regurgitating what we're seeing. He talks about the media doing that. And it really does highlight the importance, the essential nature of science itself. And we are very much, you know, what is the Northern Miner? It is a scientific financial newspaper. It is a geology newspaper. And it has a lot of financial, I suppose we could say there's engineering as well. But at the end of the day, perhaps we put engineering under the science camp. Perhaps, I suppose we could debate that. But ultimately, as far as I see it, it is a scientific financial newspaper. A -a one-of-a-kind mix here, and I love these wild juxtapositions. So we got a fantastic talk here. And it's kind of even better because, as he says himself, I'm kind of cranky as Friedland said, and it kind of makes it even better. It is quite bleak, but sometimes the bleaker it is, the more entertaining it can be, with some reservation, of course, in case these things actually happen. So a reality check from Robert Friedland. He asked me afterwards as I went to talk to him and just say hi, say I appreciate the talk. He asked me what I thought. I said it was a good dose of reality, is what I thought. And so Feel free to leave a comment and you tell me what you think of it. But it is a fascinating talk. It is a provocative talk. And I think it's so important as the world really enters a period of enormous change, the fourth turning, as many call it, you know, a generational change, a generation of tumult and, you know, crisis and where institutions are destroyed and new ones are made, it is a time to have provocative conversations and not think homogeneously on any issue. 
you know, and just finally, like, let's just back up at these other incredibly huge stories that are happening. I mean, interestingly, as we were speculating here in the last couple of weeks, you know, what's the strategy in the Middle East from Hamas's perspective? And the only one that I could come to was that they were looking to provoke a huge reaction. And, you know, Giorgio Maloney, the prime minister of Italy, actually said that as well. And I've heard other commentators say that too. So, so it's an interesting moment where Israel is forced to decide on whether to take the bait to show strength and not show weakness. A Faustian bargain, if ever there was one, and unfortunately, it's probably not an exaggeration to say world war is at risk, shockingly enough, to say those words. So, no small matter, the stakes are unbelievably huge. Now, one other huge story that we have to pay attention to is this rise in yields. And there was something I want to highlight on this whole rise in yields. Robert Friedland, again, brought up a profound idea that was kind of easily glossed over. It's maybe three quarters the way through this edited audio that I'm providing. And he had a very interesting take on metal stocks. He said there's hardly anything left. But what's going on is people that have the metal are trying to unload it because the interest of keeping it in stock, the interest rates, because they're higher, people want to get rid of their metal. So what that's doing is it's keeping the prices down while stocks deplete. This is a profound insight that, frankly, I have not heard anywhere else. And frankly, if you take away one thought from this show today, I would go with that one. That was interesting, and that is why Friedland really gets these headliner roles at these conferences. So, big shout out and thank you to Robert Friedland to joining the Northern Miner at the Canadian Mining Symposium. It is an excellent discussion, full of provocation and controversy even. Also coming up for this week's CEO Spotlight, we have Andrew Williams, CEO of New Pacific Metals, who discusses its fascinating silver discovery in Bolivia. And what's super interesting is Andrew Williams says it's basically not too far away from one of the greatest silver discoveries ever by the Spaniards in the 16th century. So a major potential project in Bolivia. So Andrew Williams, for those history buffs out, and I know a lot of you out there are history buffs, Do listen to this week's CEO Spotlight. You are in for a very interesting discussion as we continue to learn here on a weekly basis. Thank you once again for joining us. If you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on Twitter at Northern Miner and on Instagram at The Northern Miner and on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where we also host these podcasts and wherever podcasts are available, including Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and SoundCloud. And with that, let's turn to Andrew Williams, CEO of New Pacific Metals for this week's CEO Spotlight. Joining us today, I'm very pleased to welcome Andrew Williams, CEO of New Pacific Metals, to the Northern Miner podcast for this week's CEO Spotlight. Andrew, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Adrian. Pleasure to be here. Well, it's great to have you. And New Pacific Metals is working with silver, which is a particularly charged and interesting part of the metals market. So for those that aren't familiar with New Pacific Metals, tell us about the company and what you guys are up to. Thanks, Adrian. So New Pacific Metals, we are a precious metals exploration and development company operating exclusively in Bolivia. Our journey started in 2017 with an exploration concept called the Silver Sand Project. And over the last six years, we've put a huge amount of drilling into Silver Sand Project and made what we believe is one of the best primary silver discoveries that's been made anywhere in the world in this past decade. In January of this year, we released a PEA study on the Silver Sand Project, highlighting the very strong economics associated with that discovery. And if that wasn't a tough enough act to follow, our company acquired in 2021 our second project, Karangas. And we made that discovery late 21, drilled it all throughout last year to the end of April this year. 
And then last month, we released our inaugural resource estimate at our Karangas project, outlining 560 million silver equivalent ounces in the indicated category and another 110 million ounces in the inferred category. And so we do have a third project as well, our Silver Strike project that we commenced a scout drilling program last year on and had some very encouraging initial discovery results. So now we're we're here uh, as a very successful exploration company discovering deposits, the old-fashioned way, Greenfields exploration, and now we're undergoing an important transition from being a successful exploration company into a project development company. Impressive. So things are moving along quite quickly. It's interesting, Bolivia. I mean, oftentimes people will associate it with lithium. So how did you find this deposit? And tell us a little bit about just working in Bolivia. Yeah, so I always say that if you want to find elephants, you go to Africa. If you want to find silver, go to Bolivia. Going back in history, 1545, the world famous Cerro Rico de Potosí silver deposit was discovered by the Spaniards, and that financed the Spanish empire for the next, call it, 300 years. I mean, it was, in, I think, geologically, one of the, if not the largest silver discoveries that's ever been made in the history of the world. And that Potosi silver mine is just 35 kilometers southwest of our flagship silver sand discovery. So the mineral endowment in Bolivia is fantastic. I think that was, uh, again, an exploration concept that, that arose in, in 2016 that we eventually closed on in 2017. Went down there and our early exploration team sensed that there was significant potential for a major discovery and subsequently they were proven right. And then importantly, because the country hasn't seen a lot of modern exploration over the last, call it 10, 20 years, we were then able to leverage our first mover advantage that we established at Silver Strike into acquiring the Karangas and Silver Strike projects for almost nothing. And then most recently, our Karangas discovery has been the next major exploration program to bear significant fruit for the company. So, I mean, it's just been a, a fantastic country for us to operate in. And we've had certainly a lot of success being in Bolivia. You know, it sounds like, you know, when you tell the story of the Spaniards, it sounds like they found a mountain of silver or something like that. I mean, it, it's a pretty, pretty impressive. So just finally on the Bolivian side of things, how is it with communities? Because again, each of these countries kind of has its sort of quirks and each community, do you feel like you have the social license, so to speak? Have you guys already reached out? How is it to work, you know, with the government there? Uh, I guess, what's the social environment of your project? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Getting the social license to operate is critical in Bolivia, as it is in pretty much every jurisdiction in the world. So that's something that is a very important objective of our company here. And just thinking though more broadly about Bolivia, the, the thing that's I really emphasize to folks is that this is a mining country going back to 1545 and the Spaniards were in the department of Potosi. There were three great major mines built in the last cycle, Sumitomo's San Cristobal operation and Pan American Silver's San Vicente operation and, and core mining. They built their uh, San Bartolome project. Great mines all within the department that we're operating. And so it's very much a mining country and we're in Potosi, which is like the Nevada of Bolivia. And so that's important. We're not bringing a new concept of mining to this country. It's something that they know and is deeply embedded in their culture. And then as far as our silver sand project goes, I mean, that's that's what we've been actively involved in this year. To be frank, with our PEA study just released in January of this year, that was really an important document for us to have, to be able to talk to exactly what the impacts of this project will be because certainly we've been there since 2017. We've been able to drill at our silver sand project 136,000 meters, 550 holes. So we've been very active and very, very successful operating at our silver sand project. And now we're undergoing that really important transition as now we've got a, a mine plan. Here's how much silver we're going to produce. Here's what the plant's going to look like, et cetera. So our community relations activities have really switched into another gear as we get more specific about what the real 
impact of this project will be, which will be fantastic. I mean, it, economically, this will be a very important project for Bolivia. It'll generate 500 direct jobs, probably another five or six times that in indirect jobs in a part of the country that really needs the work. So we believe in the benefits that this project will bring to the country. And that's part of what we're actively at work getting done this year. Okay, so if I understand you correct, then your goal here is to actually build out the mine yourselves, then it's not like you're looking to just do some drilling and then show the world and then someone please buy us. You guys are out to start developing this mine. Potentially, yes, I'll qualify that as we are gearing the company up as if we could finance and build it ourselves. That's the beauty of the Silver Sand project is the initial capex of $308 million. That's very much something that we could finance and build ourselves should we go down that path. That being said, we're not hellbent here or entrenched as a management group saying that we want to build this thing at all costs. And, and no, that's certainly not the case. I mean, if there was an opportunity for someone else with a bigger balance sheet to come in and, and build it, like certainly we would be you know, open-minded to that type of, a, of an outcome. But the way we can Put ourselves in as strong a position as possible if we were to eventually sell the company or the project is to build the capability in-house and do that really good work get the permits get the studies complete so that you can put it this project as a shovel ready permitted major silver developments on a platter for someone else should they want to go down that road and if we don't get the kind of bid that we think reflects the full value of the company then we'd be in a position to build it that's how we're gearing our company up we're not just going to hope that one day we'll get taken out it's hope's not a strategy so we're going to operate as if we're going to finance and build this thing ourselves well, it sounds like a very reasonable approach. Finally, then on Silver Sand, then. So what does come next then? Put a little flesh on the bone here. So what are your sort of next steps in your roadmap, so to speak? Yeah, so we completed the PEA study in January of this year. We've done all the drilling that we need from a resource perspective. Almost all of our PEA study was based on measured and indicated resources. So really no additional drilling required. And so PFS study, that's something that we're working towards, and we want to complete that by the first half of next year. And then from there, we'll go from PFS into full feasibility study, which would then be targeting the back half of next year. And then our goal is to sync up the receipt of our environmental permits with the completion of the full feasibility study. So put us in a position, let's call it the, the back half of next year, where we've got a fully financed shovel-ready project that will produce roughly 16 million ounces per year of silver in each of the first four years at roughly $10 an ounce all in sustaining cost. And that's what we want to get to. We want to be in in that very strong and enviable position where our our next major decision is, is do we finance this ourselves or ultimately sell it to someone else who's going to be happy to build it? That's what we're gearing up for in our Silver Sand project is heads down, get the technical work done and obtain the environmental permit. And is it close to infrastructure? How how is that side of things? Yeah, the Silver Sand Project, 35 kilometers south of the project is there's a two lane paved national highway and a power line. And so from that highway, there's an existing dirt and gravel road that takes you to the site. Really the most important piece of infrastructure that we'll need to build is we'll need to tie a power line in of 35k that goes along that gravel road and then build a small water reservoir and that's about it but 45 minutes from the major center of potosi where that world famous silver mine is located so i mean it's, it's very well well endowed from an infrastructure perspective okay excellent so as we wrap up here then what is your message for investors what is the opportunity here of new pacific metals yeah so we've talked extensively about the silver sand project which truly is a strategic asset in our industry. As I flagged, we consider it to be one of the best, if not the best primary silver discoveries that's been made anywhere in the world in this past decade. And so we're nurturing that project along to get it to the point where it can actually be a mine. And so that's part one. But part two is going again, going back to our history, 2017, we started with just the Silver Sand project. And then in 2021, acquired Karangas. And so we've been drilling like mad at Karangas for the last two years. We put our resource out. Karangas has three and a half times as much metal as our Silver Sand project. 
And so we're not just a one asset company. At Kerangus, we're continuing to press that project along as well. We're in the process of completing a preliminary economic assessment at Kerangus that we expect to release also in the first half of next year. So lots of important studies being completed within our company. But most importantly, at Kerangus, we think that there's more to give in that district. So that discovery at Kerangus was blind. It was under 35, 40 meters of cover. We've done an IP survey in the greater Kerangus basin that's flagged several additional anomaly, some bigger than the discovery that we've already made. So we want to get in and drill that as well to see what else is in the Karangas district. I think that's really important. And then we don't talk much about our Silver Strike project, just because we have so much on our plate at Silver Sand and Karangas. But then in addition to that, we've also got a project generation team that walks the ground and is looking for, for new properties for us. Because if you really step back and say, wow, look at these discoveries that we've been able to make the old fashioned way, green fields in such a small amount of time really speaks to the geological prospectivity in Bolivia. And so for us, it's, it's yes, these projects that we have are world class, but we're also operating on the forefront of this geologically prolific country. And we think that there's going to be more to give beyond just what we've found so far. Andrew Williams, CEO of New Pacific Metals, thank you for joining us on this week's CEO Spotlight. Thank you very much, Adrian. It's been a pleasure. Turning to the website, China ups critical minerals heat with graphite controls. This is Reuters via mining.com, October 23rd, just yesterday here. China is upping the critical mineral stakes by curbing exports of graphite, a key raw material in electric vehicle batteries. Of course, this is a column. The West can't say it wasn't warned. When China announced restrictions on exports of gallium and germanium in July, former Vice Commerce Minister Wei Zhan Guo was quoted in the China Daily as saying it was, quote, just the start, end quote, if the West continued to target China's high technology sector. Restricting the flow of the two metals used in the manufacture of silicon chips was, quote, a well-thought-out heavy punch, end quote, in reaction to the U.S. Chips Act, Wei said. The Biden administration has since tightened restrictions on the flow of advanced artificial intelligence chips to China, announcing on Friday a new raft of measures aimed at closing previous loopholes. China is responding in kind, this time taking aim at the West's electric vehicle ambitions. There is much potential for further escalation in this unfolding critical minerals battle between China and the West. Graphite has slipped under the radar in the broader critical raw materials debate. China's control of other battery inputs such as cobalt, nickel, and lithium has grabbed the headlines. Those are all used to make the battery cathode. It won't work, however, without an anode which is invariably made of graphite. Indeed, graphite is the largest EV battery component by weight, typically accounting for between 50 and 100 kilograms. Let me repeat that. Graphite is the largest EV battery component by weight, typically accounting for between 50 and 100 kilograms. That is a lot of graphite. Continuing on, China is the dominant player in the global supply of both natural graphite and synthetic graphite. Remember I was saying there are different kinds of graphite, and the synthetic graphite has been taking an increasing share of the market. The country accounts for around two-thirds of all natural graphite production, according to consultancy Benchmark Minerals, supplies around 98% of the world's synthetic graphite anodes. So here's what I was trying to explain in the introduction. China accounts for two-thirds of all natural graphite production and 98% of all synthetic graphite, which is being used more and more for electric vehicle battery production. This is almost a complete stranglehold on the synthetic graphite market. The West's dependency on Chinese supply has seen graphite recently join the likes of cobalt and rare earths on the U.S. Department of Energy's list of critical raw materials. And, of course, as we've mentioned in an earlier episode, the Department of Defense awarded $37 million in July to Graphite One. I mean, that's pretty serious. Graphite One, as far as I understand, is basically an exploration company. And this is so urgent that the Department of Defense has given this Graphite Exploration Company $37 million. So it's almost like they could see it coming. Quite interesting. Now, just to follow up on this before people start panicking. As far as the gallium and germanium, which we saw, I believe, on August 1st take effect, this is interesting. 
further down the article, if gallium and germanium are anything to go by, expect a flurry of export activity in the run-up to the December 1st deadline, and then a collapse in activity. Some Chinese companies have received their licenses and many more applications are under review, but the process has essentially halted exports of both metals for the time being. Prices of both have unsurprisingly increased. The world's graphite supply chain could well be in for a similar short-term shock. So many companies have received licenses, I suppose, to export germanium and gallium, and many more applications are under review, but the process has essentially halted exports of both metals for the time being. So it's kind of saying two things at the same time. In other words, some companies have been given the license to export germanium and gallium, but none has been exported from how I understand that sentence. Pretty fascinating. Continuing on, China plans to boost state cobalt reserves after prices drop. This is Bloomberg News via mining.com. So cobalt prices have languished for a while here. So China, like a good trader, is looking to stockpile while prices are cheap. China is planning to boost its strategic stockpile of cobalt According to people familiar with the matter, just three months after the government last bought the metal used in everything from electric vehicle batteries to aerospace alloys, the National Food and Strategic Reserves Administration, which manages the state commodity stockpiles, has agreed to buy about 3,000 tons of cobalt, said the people who are not authorized to speak publicly. This follows a meeting of five producers and traders with government officials in Beijing on October 20th. So China is stockpiling cobalt while prices are low. Continuing on, Bloomberg News via mining.com. Labor dispute keeps 540 South African miners stuck underground. Around 540 workers at Gold One International's Modder East Mine have been prevented from returning to the surface by labor union members after a dispute over recognition, according to a company spokesman. Workers at the operation near Johannesburg were kept underground after the night shift ended by the Association of Mine Workers and Construction Union, according to John Herricourt, a Gold One spokesman. Quote, last night we heard AMCU members prevented workers from coming back up, end quote. So it's not clear here. It sounds like they're still underground. The final line of the article, production is at a standstill as the company meets with labor and tries to gain access to the mine to help employees who have been injured in the dispute, Herricourt said. Now, of course, this is probably, you know, from the company who is probably against the union. So they may be, you know, painting this in a particularly negative light because it sounds quite shocking, doesn't it? Continuing on, asteroid mining startup to launch mission in early 2024. That is a few months away. This is by a staff writer at the Northern Miner. Astroforge, a U.S.-based startup with plans to mine asteroids, is fine-tuning details for the launch of a spacecraft in the first quarter of next year, which would make it the first private company to visit an M-type asteroid and operate in deep space. The Brocker 2 spacecraft will travel on Elon Musk's SpaceX rocket, which will carry a drill to explore the moon's surface as part of NASA's Artemis program. Astroforge mission will continue further until reaching an M-type asteroid, which contains higher concentration of metal than regular asteroids. If successful, it would mark a significant milestone on the startup's mission to commercially mine asteroids for critical resources. I mean, this has been a dream for a long time here, and perhaps this will turn to reality. We have a quote from CEO Matthew Gailich, who said in April, quote, With a finite supply of precious metals on Earth, We have no other choice than to look to deep space to source cost-effective and sustainable materials. Yes, so again, you know, quite interesting in the context of Robert Friedland's talk. And finally, one more story here. This is James Cooper for the Northern Miner, Why Junior Explorers Will Emerge from the Dust. No doubt 2023 has been a difficult year for the junior mining sector. Across the board, we've seen small cap explorers sell down towards multi-year lows. A decade of underinvestment in new supply and an enormous metal-intensive energy transition have offered little incentive for investors to back the next generation of deposits. The depth of this correction has certainly caught a lot of pundits by surprise. In fact, the situation right now has some folks calling this a repeat of the ugly days of 2016. If you're not familiar, that year marked a major cyclical bottom for the mining industry. There are certainly some interesting parallels to draw from. Just like today, junior mining stocks were capital starved, and also like today, junior mining stocks were trading around multi-year lows. But there are key differences in today's markets. 
commodity prices are far higher than they were in 2016. Just take our old friend copper. In 2016, this commodity was in the gutter. It traded for just $2 per pound. Today, it sits at $3.60 per pound, around 80% higher. It's a similar picture across the commodity landscape. Nickel traded for just $8,400 per ton. 2016, it now trades 120% higher, hovering at $18,300 per ton. Meanwhile, precious metals performed slightly earlier in late 2015. Back then, gold traded as low as $1,020 per ounce. It's now hovering at around $1,900 per ounce. Silver is also much higher. It bottomed out at $13 per ounce. Now it trades 80% higher at $22 per ounce. You get the point. Across the board, commodity prices remain above cyclical lows. And finally, just a couple more paragraphs here. Fortune favors the juniors. Investors made a fortune buying stocks at 2016 levels. But in my mind, the opportunity in today's markets is better still. I mean, yeah, I highly recommend for those that haven't heard Cam Curry's interview that I did about a month ago uh, that's well worth listening to, particularly for gold stocks. With commodity prices remaining relatively high, there's a gaping mismatch between the fundamental strength of the resource sector versus equity valuations. Now, I'm not talking about all mining equities. The large caps have held up well in 2023. The real opportunity comes from explorers and developers offering cents on the dollar value from where they traded two years ago. So read the whole article on northernminer.com. Those are your news stories. Now, let's take a look at metal prices. Turning to metal prices, let's take a quick look at the bond market here. We did not discuss that in the introduction. The U.S. 10-year bond is at 4.869%. So let's call it 4.87%. And last week was at 4.74. So it is still up 0.13% on the week. Now, it's important we mention it did pierce 5% in the last couple of days here. So that is significant, a massive psychological number. So it has pulled back. It'll be very interesting to see if that was the top or if this goes somewhere else. And also, interestingly, the Italian 10-year bond also went right up to 5% and now is at 4.83%. So only 0.02% on the week higher. But again, Italian bonds, I'm starting to hear could cause some problems for the Eurozone. And of course, the UK 10-year gilt is at 4.553%. So quite low relative to US and Italian bonds. I think I saw someone on Twitter post how Greek 10-year bonds were lower than the US 10-year in terms of yield. How strange is that? Turning to precious metals, uh, gold is trading at $1,973.70 per ounce. That is $41 higher than last week. So gold also went right up to $2,000 there. We're seeing a lot of things happen in the financial markets here. Silver is trading at $23.04 per ounce. That is $0.29 higher than last week. Platinum is also trading higher at $896.86 per ounce. That is $5 higher than last week. And palladium is trading lower at $1,129.19 per ounce. That is $20 lower than last week. Turning to industrial metals, copper is a penny lower at $3.56 per pound. Iron ore is also lower at $118.45 per metric ton. That is a dollar lower than last week. Aluminum is unchanged at $0.99 per pound. Lead is $0.03 higher at $0.97 per pound. Nickel is also higher at $8.35 per pound. That is six cents higher than last week. Tin is lower at $11.33 per pound. That is five cents lower than last week. Cobalt is unchanged at $15.16 per pound. Lithium is higher at $23.44 per pound. That is a dollar higher than last week. Uranium is unchanged at $69 per pound. And zinc is a penny lower at a dollar and 10 cents per pound. Zooming out, I would say gold and silver stand out, particularly gold, 
is having gone quite a bit higher. I mean, we've seen Bitcoin, you know, mentioning gold. Uh, we have seen Bitcoin with a monster move in the last couple of weeks on, I guess, Bitcoin ETF news. But basically, gold and silver are the standouts here with really kind of no big changes, some higher, some lower in the rest of the metals, muddling along here with the other metals. And those are your metal prices. Coming up, Robert Friedland at the Canadian Mining Symposium, and he discusses the green energy transition, the Middle East lithium metal versus lithium ion batteries and developments that could happen there, as well as the lack of nickel and metal to provide for an energy transition and much, much more a dramatic talk to cap off the Canadian Mining Symposium second day in London. I hope you enjoy it and I will see you on the other side. So Robert, you were part of our very first Canadian Mining Symposium at Canada House back in 2017. Thank you for supporting it and getting it off the ground. And that time, you and I also sat down, and you were really emphasizing the role of specific minerals in addressing environmental issues. And my God, how ahead of the time you were. Everything you said then has come to fruition. What's changed a bit, and where I'd like to start that's related to that, that I certainly didn't see coming, is now how much governments have become key players in energy transition. We know that they're trying to get on top of their supply chain. They've realized that they need to be part of this. But you're an entrepreneur. What's your take on how important fiscal policy, let's start with the West, fiscal policy in the States, IRA. How important is the government going to be to this energy transition? If you put a a, a 100 plasma physicists in a room, and you ask them to define the word energy, they can't define it. We can't agree. I suppose we could uh, start with a question to your audience. Uh, For those of you that have the concept that electrons move down a copper wire, when electricity flows that wire, will you please raise your hand? Well, you're all idiots, the ones of you that raise your hands, because electrons don't move when electricity goes down a copper wire. So the average, uh, it's a magnetic field that moves down the wire. And so most people have no concept of what electricity is. And so if we define energy as uh, electrical energy used for the benefit of humanity or some other such definition, we have to think, what does the word energy mean? And then we add the word transition. Transition to what? You got a billion people on this planet that burn firewood to live. And they haven't yet, you know, when, when Thomas Alva Edison made the first light bulb, he put coal in a little steam engine and it made a turn and made direct current and made the first light bulb go on. We have a series of transitions and we have a billion people on this planet that have no access to electrical energy. As I walked in the door this afternoon, we're burning more coal or we're burning more oil than we've ever burned in the history of the world. 103.8 million barrels per day, to be precise. We spent $4 trillion on putting up solar cells and, and so forth. And, and I'd say we've gone from about 83% of the world economy running on hydrocarbon and coal to about 81.3 for $4 trillion. But the quantum of oil that we're burning is greater than at all time because the world economy is still expanding. In other words, there's been zero progress on any rational definition of energy transition. The whole thing's greenwashing and a fraud and virtue signaling. So we get all these junior mining companies all hyped up and they want to promote the next lithium deal as if they're saving humanity, like you want to impress your wife, you buy her a Tesla, you think you're being green. It's a ludicrous joke. You're not going to stop warming at 1.5 degrees if it's anthropomorphic, if human beings, if we are causing that apparent measurable global warming, you're not going to solve the problems of the world by buying an electric car. That's so ludicrously stupid and absurd. you got to get real about this. Mary Barra runs General Motors. She says, oh, we're going to save the world. We're going to make 30 million electric cars a year. With current lithium-ion technology, uh, you'd have to, like, uh, the, the destruction we caused and the global warming gas we caused to build those electric cars, we might as well just sit on our chair and do nothing. The largest copper mine in the world, La Escadita, has gone from about 1.7% copper down to a current head grade of about 045 of 
That's a two-thirds reduction in grade in the last 15 or 20 years. Every cubic meter of rock you have to grind to get the copper out needs two cubic meters of water. And so you're grinding more and more rock to get less and less copper, right? And you're using more and more energy per cubic meter of rock ground. Where does the electricity come from in the grid? If you buy a Tesla in America, it's 50% a coal-burning car. 50% of our static load of electrical energy in America is coal. So, you know, you just bought your wife a coal-burning car. This is ridiculous. You think Elon's saving the world by building these cars? Why do you think he's selling his stock? Because he knows that the current generation of batteries is just not sustainable. The Chinese are just nuking tropical jungle in Indonesia to mine nickel laterite to make raw material for nickeliferous batteries. It's just a disaster. They're generating huge amounts of global warming gas at CATL to make those batteries. And we're addicted to Chinese batteries. So it's just stunning to me all the crap I see in popular media about energy transition, which is just blatantly false. And since I'm old and I'm cranky, I might as well be a truth teller. I've got nothing to lose. I'm not getting paid to be here, by the way. No, you're not. I'm exceptionally cranky today. I just, <laughs> I just flew from Mongolia. So the first thing I want to tell you is that um, the current generation of batteries is going to be toast. It's good for another three or four years, but there's a whole new generation of batteries coming. And so if you can't look forward in technology and figure out what these things are going to be made out of, you don't know what to start mining now, because if you're going to build a mine, Sean will agree to be. It takes 10 years to find a mine or 15 years to find a mine, another 10 years to build it. So you better look way down the road to see what batteries are going to be made out of, because they're not going to be made out of the crap that's being promoted by Canadian junior mining companies. I'm sorry. But I'm, I'm hoping sure, you're going to tell us what they're going to be I, I would out short of. every lithium company in the world. Now, lithium is the lightest metal in the, in the known universe. There may be parallel universes, but in the one that we know, lithium is element number three. Element number one is hydrogen. Element number two is helium. Element number three is lithium. It's the lightest metal. We'll never engineer our way around that fact in this universe. But batteries of the future, the what we call the cathode, or one side of the battery, will be lithium metal. There won't be lithium ion. There'll be lithium metal. Okay. Now, out of MIT, a startup has found a way to go directly from low-grade brine directly to the metal in one step. So we don't need lithium carbonate or hydroxide. What the mining industry is doing today is mining huge amounts of the Earth's crust to make lithium via the carbonate or hydroxide route. So the problem is that you have to get 99.9999999% of the impurities out of that lithium. Because if there's any impurity in your battery as you charge it and discharge it, you grow little stalactites. And if they grow from one side of the battery to the other, you've got a bomb. I mean, your cell phone battery could take down a 747, let alone an electric truck, like an electric Hummer. Coming at you with 3,000 pounds of batteries, you're driving with your wife and kids, and you get this smell of burning metal. You slam on the brakes, grab the dog, grab the kids, and run like hell, because you can't put the fire out. If you put water on a lithium-ion battery factory uh, fire, water is dihydrogen monoxide. You're just adding more oxygen to the fire. So firemen just stand back and let it burn a hole in the road. The only way to stop that fire is to put 30 or 40 meters of sand on top of that burning car and deprive the reaction of oxygen. So people don't understand where we're headed with energy density or fundamental chemistry, but we're going to kill this lithium hydroxide and carbonate business. So we'll start with this depressing message for all you lithium miners. If we're going to have a transition, we have to use very common materials. We can't use expensive and rare materials like nickel. Just There isn't enough of it. There's zero chance of having 8 billion people driving around with a nickel-liferous battery. I hope you're following me. I hope I'm not saying anything beyond the limits of your comprehension, because I'm looking right at you. Somebody has to tell you the truth. So what we want is, uh, in the old paradigm in mining, high grade is good and low grade is bad, right? But there's so much lithium in brines and oil fields. If you go to Saudi Arabia, they drilled a well. They would open up the productive horizon for gas or oil. The saltwater horizons, they would leave behind the drill pipe. Now they're opening up those saltwater horizons. They're loaded with lithium. Same thing in the Canadian oil fields. I mean, they're just loaded with lithium. So you can go from that lithium and that brine directly to lithium metal in one step. You don't have to build a refinery. 
because technology now exists to only pull the lithium out of the brine and leave the impurities behind. You don't need the refinery. Do you hazard to guess how far away we are from commercial this application of that? This is opening soon at a theater near you immediately. This is called disruption. Right. So uh, Don Sadaway was head of material science at MIT. You're going to argue with him? 40 years there. And uh, Stan Whittingham got the Nobel Prize for inventing the lithium-ion battery. And these two are cooperating at Pure Lithium. And for disclosure, my family office was an angel investor. But the battery they're making now is made from low-grade brine to lithium metal on one side of the battery. Once you have lithium metal on one side of the battery, you don't need nickel, you don't need cobalt, you don't need graphite. All you guys are dead. Nickel, cobalt, graphite, out the window. You can, you can use uh, iron phosphate, which is communist chips, and that's what you want. You want a battery to be made out of common materials, so 8 billion people can have one. Or you can use other metals, soon to be announced, making a phenomenal battery. This startup has a battery that has charged and discharged 500 cycles at pure lithium, 500 cycles with no measurable diminution in capacity. Cheap battery, easy to manufacture, American ingenuity. American. American. The empire strikes back. <laughs> because the, the Chinese control the lithium hydroxide chain. They go to Indonesia, they're just nuking all this tropical jungle and nickel laterite, and then just copious amounts of global warming gas generated to make these batteries. And those are the batteries you're finding at a BMW. That won't work. That, that's obscene. That, that's just silly. Like, we've really got to look at this whole situation womb to tomb, mm -hmm. cradle to grave, sperm to germ. You know, look at the whole system. I mean, if we're trying to eliminate global warming gas. Now, the Chinese are saying 2060 to achieve net zero. And the Indians are saying 2070. Well, those are the two biggest countries in the world. So what difference does it make whether we mine a little bit of lithium in Quebec and, and sort of virtue signal that we bought a Tesla? And why do you think Elon's selling his stock anyway? And if you were along two or $300 billion worth of stock, wouldn't you find an excuse to sell 50 billion worth? There's zero chance that the 12 major automakers will find enough nickel to all have nickeliferous batteries three or four years from now, and I'll tell you why I know. There's only about five or six major battery manufacturers. There's CATL, Samsung, LG, Sony, Panasonic, and you know the, the car manufacturers call these guys up and say, we need 68 trillion batteries in 2026. And they say, great, thank you for the order. Thank you very much. And then they call me. And they say, where's the metal? And the answer is the metal doesn't exist. Not in a way that's green or sustainable. It's like trying to get the contents of the Hoover Dam through a garden hose. And it's just not going to happen. It's apparent to any readily intelligent person, which is why when I've been, I've been in Saudi Arabia 10 times last year, I, I always tell the story about the 55 male billionaires I've interviewed. There's one there, Sean Rusin. We'll try him out. He's in the front row. <laughs> I asked all 55 billionaires, do you put your pants on both legs at a time or do you put on one leg and stand on the leg and stick on the other pant leg? Because I think if Sean tries to jump into both pant legs at the same time, he'll break his front teeth. You try it. It's really hard. There's probably some male human being here who can effectively jump into both pant legs at the same time. I haven't found one billionaire that hasn't admitted. He puts on one pant leg and then the other one. So how can we stop burning coal and oil and have an energy transition? Like, what's the plan here? Do you understand what's going on in Israel today? What's going on in the Middle East? Do you have any idea how dangerous the current moment is? We're more likely to have $200 or $300 crude oil tomorrow morning. Anything could happen here. And so human beings just need to feed their kids. And the fundamental needs are we need fresh water for everybody. We need food for everybody. We need to organize this planet in such a way that we don't blow each other up. And so what we have now are two competing paradigms in these two crazy tribes we have in the United States, these two competing tribes. One tribe says, I want to save the world. I'm virtuous. I'm green. I'm going to green the world economy. I need nickel, copper, cobalt, platinum, palladium. I need mining. Because everything you touch, we either mined it or we grew it agriculturally. So to save the world, all of a sudden we need copper, right? The other tribe says, holy shit, for national security, the Army, Navy, Air Force wants these metals for national defense. We're out of 155 millimeter howitzer shells. In the Ukrainian conflict, 
More conventional explosives have gone off in one year than all of World War II, absent the atomic bombs that the United States dropped on Japan. And we're low on 155 millimeter howitzer shells. We're like seven or eight years just to make them. What do you think they're made out of? And do you think when a, you know, you know these HIMARS, these very accurate uh, <laughs> artillery, the, the, the shell comes out of the cannon like this, it reaches its apogee, and then it sprouts little wings, and then it's guided by satellite. It comes down within 40 centimeters of its target, which is somewhere between me and you. It takes out this whole building. That shell is called a copperhead. You guys can all Google it. Go to Google, Google copperhead. 155 millimeter howitzer shell. Do you think that copper is recycled? <laughs> you got a bunch of greedy say about recycling. And, and so the intensity of metal demand in conflict is beyond your wildest imagination. William Randolph Hearst owned the Butte, Montana copper mine. In World War I, you needed a telescope to see the copper price. In World War II, America made its pennies out of zinc, not copper, because copper was so valuable. And so we're heading into a situation where one tribe, concerned about national security, wants these medals. And I know you're going to have trouble believing me here, but the United States military would like to electrify the Abrams tank. Now, why? Is it to prevent global warming gas? Not really. The Abrams tank, which is this very sophisticated piece of kit that uh, NATO wants to give the Ukrainian government, has a jet engine in it. And that jet engine turns at very high speed and generates heat and a shitty little drone can see that heat and send a missile there. So for it to run quieter in terms of its heat signature, they want it to be all electric. Can you imagine how much nickel we need for those batteries? So these two ends are competing. One side of humanity wants to destroy the, you know, we're, we're right on the verge of destroying ourselves as a species. And the other half is worried about global warming. Now, which is gonna kill you first or your kids first? So we really need to calm down this dialogue because we're balkanizing the world economy into two very apparent opposing camps. We're tearing the supply chains apart, which are insanely inflationary. Yeah. We had gold go up 40 bucks today just because Jamie Dimon said this is the most dangerous moment he can recall. Since any of us were born, as I'm sitting to talk to you now. Do you agree with that statement? Oh, definitely. This is the most dangerous moment we've seen in our lifetime. And we got to talk about it, we got to think about it, we got to cool it a little bit because the situation is really, truly getting out of hand. And, you know, I've worked in 65 countries. I've recently been in China talking to my Chinese friends. I've been in Saudi Arabia. I was in Jordan last week. We're in a very, very difficult existential situation because it does appear that the world is warming and there is no chance, I mean zero chance, that we're going to limit warming to one and a half degrees. We lost that a long time ago. And it's only a question of how bad is it really going to get. I mean, these forest fires in British Columbia or in Siberia were psychedelic. All of Russia is paved with uh, oil and gas pipelines that were built during the Soviet era. And those pipelines are sitting on permafrost. If that permafrost starts to melt, the entire pipeline system in Russia will be destroyed from that permafrost melting. And we're living off of hydrocarbon. If Vladimir Putin decides to cut hydrocarbon production in half this winter, he'd drive oil to 150 bucks a barrel and put the Donald back in the White House. When I was in California recently, it was $6.20 a gallon. The average American is there filling up his gas tank. He sees that six twenty, he's pissed off. What about $10 a gallon 12 months from now? And, you know, you have to understand the other side doesn't have to fight you back with conventional means. The Russians play chess. They're some of the most intelligent people on the planet. Usually the grandmaster in that game is chess. I, you probably saw the Queen's Gambit, but it was fiction. The Russian usually wins. <laughs> <laughs> so we live in a very dangerous world, and we have to kind of look where mining fits into all this. You know. So what were we talking about? We are talking about energy transition. Transition to what? Transition how? How are we going to get there? How do we truly leave a better world for our grandkids? Because well, we're only here, you know, for a few moments, then we're gone. You've taken it to a very interesting place where I'd like to pursue it more. Because in many ways, I have, I've never talked to you about Milton Friedman. I have no idea what you think about him. But in my mind, you represent the best of Milton Friedman in the sense that when countries are trading together, they get along. They find ways of mutual understanding. You represent that when you're dealing with China and the Congo throughout your career. You, you're exemplary at this, working with other people from other cultures. Yeah. 
What lessons can you draw hope from that? Or is it so bleak right now that there's not much that we can do? I mean, you have a unique position on this that most people do not have. Well, it's um, the trend is not your friend at the moment. If you want to look after the welfare of your kids and your grandkids, the trend is not your friend. We just don't understand each other. I mean, you know, like in America, it's the land of individualism. Everybody has the right to carry a 45 caliber revolver. Even a little, little old lady and a, a grandmother in Texas might pull out a 45 caliber revolver and drill a hole in your head if you insult her. Or, or let's say you, you lane change in L.A. and you piss the other guy off, he might shoot you, right? We have this autonomous little capsule we drive around and everybody's armed. In China, uh, society is organized like a great big hive of bees for the communal benefit of the hive. I mean, this is an ancient 5,000-year-old culture, and they, they give royal jelly to one bee, and they make a queen bee. But if anybody hits that hive with a stick, every one of those bees is a suicide bomber. And in the Quran, it says the only animal that Allah speaks to directly is the honeybee. It's a different concept of communal benefit. And the, you know, the Communist Party of China is the Communist Party of China. I didn't say it's my best friend. I didn't say I'm in love with it. I'm just saying that the way the thinking works in response to generations of humility, when the British got there and forced them to buy opium from India and took their silver, they remember this shit. Yeah, we like to forget that in the you, West. You know the they famous don't. story about Deng Xiaoping, and he was, he was in his 90s in a cloud of smoke, smoking cigarettes, and the New York Times reporter asked him, what do you think about the French Revolution? And it was five minutes of blue smoke, and then he said, it's too early to tell. <laughs> so, I mean, they, you know, when you insult them, it lasts for, you know, centuries, yeah. right? So, and, and we're, we're of the moment. So, American society, if we don't have exchange students going to China and Chinese students coming here, of course, we're not going to let Chinese students come here because each one of them will be treated as a spy. So, we're balkanizing the world economy. And in that act of balkanization, we're engendering massive global inflation that the Fed can't control. I mean, the Feds are idiots. I mean, the Federal Reserve Board, they, they told you that inflation was transitory, remember? Yeah. So they never saw it coming because they don't understand that when you balkanize the world economy, everything you used to buy at Walmart said made in China. In America today, you can run an ad that says, uh, I'm McDonald's, I need somebody to flip a hamburger for $30 an hour. Nobody shows up. 15% of the population has long COVID. And even in China, the kids don't want to work. They say they'd rather lay flat. They say, I don't want to be part of this system anymore. Like three and a half million young women, you know, making all Apple products in a, in a factory five miles long. People all over the world are re-examining their life post-COVID. COVID's been a very profound phenomenon that none of us understand. Really, we don't understand. What we do know is that something's different yes. post-COVID. And that's why miners have to get together and look at each other and say, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? So we need an entirely new way to mine. The whole industry has to be reinvented from first principles. Not an easy thing to do. I mean, mining is not for intelligent people, huh? You all know how difficult it is. And a lot of people think it's inherently evil, right? What sort of changes do you think are achievable in the next five to ten years? Well, first of all, we have to try to mine in the United States. I mean, no intelligent person has done that in several generations. I mean, Pebble is a great mine for the 29th century, perhaps. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's above a, a pristine salmon fishery. If I owned Pebble, I'd probably go underground and high grade it and keep the tailings underground. I don't know. There's, there's technology to develop Pebble that wouldn't bother the salmon, but it's just... Everything is caricatured in media. Everything is blown out of proportion, but it's not going to get developed anytime soon. It may eventually get developed, but we have to, first of all, parse what metals do we really need and why. And copper conducts electrical energy better than any metal in the periodic table, except for gold and silver, which are too expensive for the purpose. So I, I was just at our labs in France. I make electrical cables for megawatt electrical charges for electric trucks. I don't know if you guys know, but the electric truck industry has agreed on a new plug for electric trucks, all five major truck manufacturers, including Tesla. And these cables are about that thick in copper, you know? And they need, uh, we have a special crimp where there's no oxygen in the crimp so the cable doesn't shirt out and catch on fire. We're going to be making these copper cables. Now imagine you're going to plug an electric truck, a megawatt draw to charge that truck in 12 minutes. Do you have any idea what that's going to do to our 100-year-old electrical grid when people start plugging in these trucks? Our grid is literally a 110-year-old lady laying in bed waiting to die. The Chinese tell me 
minimum 20 trillion United States dollars to rebid the American electrical grid to enable the electrification of the automobile. I mean, the Texas grid nearly died just from a little bit of cold weather. Our grid is like balancing a pencil on your palm vertically. That's our electrical grid. There's no storage in the grid. And the sun only shines four or five hours a day. We have to pave all of America with solar cells. Yeah, pave the whole country. And there's bald eagles flying into these windmills in Montana. They're an endangered species. The Endangered Species Act says you cannot kill an endangered species. The symbol of the United States of America is flying into these windmills. You're flying north with your girlfriend, and you talk to her, and all of a sudden she's just a big puff of feathers because they can't see that wingtip velocity. You know, these windmills are getting bigger and bigger, right? Do you understand anything about physics? The longer the arm, the greater the tip velocity. So the birds can't see those windmills. They're just chewing them up. And those windmills go woof, woof, woof. People don't want to live near them. And they're very low energy density. So the, the whole thing is caricatured. Like, oh, how many times have you heard about rare earths? They're not rare. And they're not earths. And this shit gets repeated in the media endlessly. Because journalists just regurgitate what they read in some other article. At least real miners know how hard it is. I mean, you know, I talked to Sean, for example. I'm, just, I'm using him as an example because he's in the front row. He knows how hard it is to actually find gold and mine it. There's so many blah, blah, blah gold ounces. And how many ounces do you actually have in your hand? And how much energy does it take to mine those ounces or a Bitcoin? But you keep finding major global deposits all the time. So. Get, <laughs> now that we're on this roll... How many of you are guilty of doing a Google search? Please raise your hand. Have you ever done a Google search? I think we're all guilty of that, yeah, so, yes. So how much electrical energy does it require to do a Google search? I mean, I've got all these people that are doctors, dentists, lawyers, investment bankers who think they're free. Every time you do a Google search, you're using a thousand joules of electrical energy. A thousand joules of electrical energy. Every time you do a Google search, you think it's free. But it's paid for by advertising, which is embedded in the price of everything you buy. Every piece of shit you buy at Walmart, you paid for that advertising, the price of that product. That money went to Google. So you're chewing up massive amounts of electrical energy doing a Google search. So let's keep going. Do you think the Internet is green? Do you have any idea if you use AI and 8 billion people want to download holographic pornography on this planet, how much energy that requires? Everybody in Africa can download and have sex with Marilyn Monroe <laughs> huh, with AI. You just call her in. How much energy does that take? Do you think Bitcoin is green? Crypto? It's obscene. So mining traditional gold is not green because you're using energy with the grid is generating global warming gas. Do we really need gold? Well, the price of it went up $40 today. Do we need it is another question. We need copper. We need it desperately. No, we used to put gold in our teeth. You put gold in your teeth. Now you look like a Russian mafioso. We use a nice white enamel. We need copper, and we need it really badly if there's any transitional technology to stop burning coal and oil. That's really true. Are you confident we can find the copper that we need, and if so, how? Well, having said that, I'd rather there be gold in my copper. I like that. You know, because gold will never go to zero in price, and it could go to astronomic levels in the near term. I mean, it could go to silly prices. I've seen molybdenum go from a dollar a pound to thirty dollars a pound. That's thirty x. So when something really goes, nobody wants to sell it. When it, when it really moves, like this, this is no offer. And what you've got is destocking. The Fed has been raising rates, driving up the cost of money at a very rapid rate. So people are getting rid of their excess inventory of copper, zinc, metals. And so it looks like these metals are a dog because they're destocking. They're trying to reduce their interest costs. And a lot of businesses are hurt by higher rates. We're nearing the limits of destocking. There's very little metal around. So we get this paper shorting of metal against real world demand. And war is real world demand. And if you want to green the world economy, that's real world demand. So this huge clash is coming between the Army, Navy, and Air Force wanting nickel, copper, cobalt, platinum, vanadium, rhodium, scandium, you name it, and the greening of the world economy. And so we're heading for a train wreck here. And the miners have this unbelievable burden that the whole thing depends on the miners. It's the revenge of the miners. And even for food, you know, that John Deere tractor is mined. The metal to make that tractor is mined. 
You know, I, I'm guilty of having bought a lot of mining equipment. We ordered uh, at Oetogoi 40 foot diameter ring gears for the sag mills, five year wait. You get a ring gear. You want to build a mine today, you want to get the programmable logic controls. They call it ABB. The, like, I, my wife wanted to buy a, an Italian sofa from Minotti. They quoted a two year and eight month delivery for a sofa. What the hell is going on? You used to get a sofa in six months, didn't you? The whole supply chain's breaking down. The whole machine. There was a great uh, song by Bob Dylan, Subterranean Homesick Blues. Classic. The last line in the song was, the pump won't work because the vandals took the handle. He was prophetic about the supply chain. The supply chain's breaking down. So at the same time that we need these metals, if you're a miner, it's harder to get you know, the equipment you need to mine. The reason Kamo Kukula came on stream on schedule on budget is because our Chinese friends delivered the steel, the concrete, the pumps, because they want the copper. We couldn't do that without the Chinese supply chain. We couldn't have built that mine in the Democratic Republic of the Congo ahead of schedule under budget. Nobody else has done that. <laughs> Nobody. So it's really a shame that relations between the West and China are getting so stressed. But I would submit that if this keeps going, it's really not good for our kids and our grandkids. We need to engage in a realistic dialogue about how we act like the Harvard-Yale football team. We bash into each other, we break each other's collarbones, but we don't blow up this planet in a radioactive cloud of dust. The destructive capacity we have today and modern weapons are just so frightening and people have just forgotten what we're playing with here. So the situation um, that we see in the Middle East today is definitely enough to make you want to go home and pray. Because in Israel, you've got Christianity, you've got Islam, right? You've got Judaism. That's where it all started. And we keep on killing each other over God. Now, just a week or two ago, Saudi Arabia was allowing Jewish prayers. And it looked like there was a deal coming yeah. with the Saudis and the Americans and the Israelis. And there are people that didn't like the idea that that grand bargain was going to happen. So it got disrupted with the most grotesque of human rights violations. I mean, consciously having children's heads cut off in front of their mothers. The ugliest shit that you could possibly imagine was perpetrated in order to get a big reaction. That side of humanity should not be the tail that wags the dog for all the rest of us. And so, yeah, I'm deeply concerned about the situation. And the miners have a very important role to play. We're, we're called upon to develop all these metals that we desperately need. I'd like By to the way, this isn't a speech. This is just the truth. Like, you don't have to, like, just, this is what's happening, guys. Once again, a big thank you to Robert Friedland for appearing at the Northern Miners Canadian Mining Symposium in London. Great job by Anthony Vaccaro. You know, it was a difficult moderation. Robert Friedland seemed to want to go on his own path. What a fascinating talk there. A good dose of reality, as I told him afterwards. So thank you once again for joining us. If you want to help out the podcast, please leave us a review in the Apple Podcast directory. Share it with your friends. And until next week, take care. <laughs>